Dear friends, grace to you in peace from God our Creator and from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A colleague of mine named Mike told me a story about a mentor of his who was the pastor that he'd known growing up, uh, named Paul Johnson. And uh, Mike was one of these inquisitive children of the church, very loyal to the institution, full of questions, loved asking his pastor interesting and complex <laughs> questions, most of which he could answer with his theological training and experience in ministry and so forth. But one time, Mike asked Pastor Johnson a question that just stumped him. Pastor Johnson stood there and looked at him, and Mike was kind of wondering what was going on, and Pastor Johnson reached into his back pocket and pulled out a notebook and started writing on the notebook. Mike asked, um, Pastor Johnson, what are you doing? Uh, he said, I'm, I'm writing down your question. <clears throat> um, why are you writing down my question? And why did you put the pad back in your back pocket? He said, that is my list of questions to ask God when I get to heaven. <laughs> A running list that he kept with him whenever uh, he found something that he wasn't sure about. We all have questions as people in this world, and we all seek answers and knowledge and understanding. Sometimes we don't get the answers we seek, or we're disappointed with the information we receive. When I was a kid, I was an inquisitive type. Some of you probably know that about me. My parents gave me a book called Answers and More Answers, which tells me something about the level at which I must have annoyed them with the questions that I continually and incessantly ask them. There's a book of answers, and you can shut any of it. Being a curious person, I've always seen curiosity as a good thing, as a blessing as a way of perhaps experiencing the presence of God. Of course, it depends on the spirit in which the questions are asked. But perhaps you've known good Christian people, maybe some faith leaders who, who just don't like questions or think too many questions aren't a good thing or certain questions just kind of shouldn't be asked. Or perhaps asking too many questions can be a sign of faithlessness. Now, there is a spirit in which one can ask questions that can spread dissension and doubt, and that can be a mask for, for criticism or other things. But it seems to me, it seems to me that curiosity is a sign of the spirit. I've, I've heard horror stories of people leaving the church because they felt like they were asking too many questions, they were asking the wrong questions, and I find that curious and odd. I once knew a Catholic priest when I was doing clinical pastoral education at a hospital in Berkeley. He was an Irish Catholic and he had that thick brogue. And I visited once the emergency room and he was talking to some patients and they were just belly laughing, just, <laughs> just laughing. And he said, you know, the Holy Spirit, is the, or the laughter is the only true sign of the Holy Spirit, he said. I've kept that with me. And I kind of feel like curiosity or questions asked in the right spirit is a sign of the Spirit's stirring and presence. If you're with me on that. Jesus, of course, encourages his followers in today's gospel to ask and seek and knock. So uh, uncomfortability with questions is somewhat incompatible with this message of Jesus himself. The great systematic theologian Paul Tillich developed an entire theological method around this. And he got it teaching confirmation in Germany where he was born and raised as a younger pastor. He discovered teaching 13, 14 something kids that the vast majority of the answers that he was giving, these theological churchly answers, they didn't care about. It didn't mean anything to them. And he, he, he said if the church is good at answering questions, that nobody is asking. So he developed an entire theological method around existential questions, questions that arise out of our life experience, correlated with theological answers. So that the answers the church is giving are to questions that people are actually asking. 
And that was his entire program, his entire project. It was kind of a, an apologetic theology in the sense of making sense out of Christianity to a skeptical world. Now, that doesn't mean that every technical and minor question we have about every detail of church life is to be found in the Bible. I once had a very good-natured and sweet altar guild member in a previous congregation who took me aside and said, Pastor, what does the Bible say about communion cups? And I had to say the little communion cups, which was kind of a conclusion about communion cups in search of evidence in the Bible. And I had to say, that's not quite how the Bible works. It's not a manual for our worship and liturgical life, but rather a story of a people and their God and the ways in which they do and do not uh, gel with one another and follow God's way. One of those people in the Bible is Abraham. We heard a story about Abraham from Genesis today in our first reading. Abraham pleads with God for God to have mercy on the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, a most wicked and abominable city, according to the story. Now, whatever you may have heard about these two cities, Jesus makes it clear what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is, and it's inhospitality. Their unwillingness to welcome guests and to treat them with dignity and respect, and to treat them with unspeakable cruelty. That's the problem. That's the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham knows the heart of God, and he believes that in pleading with God, he can perhaps find mercy for those good people that may be left. If 50 people were righteous left in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you destroy the whole city for the sake of a 50? No, no, I won't. Okay, I won't destroy it for 50. How about 45? No, not for 45. How about 40? How about 30? 20? 10? And you get the sense, almost like at an auction, <laughs> that Abraham's haggling with God and trying to bring the price down as low as he possibly can. And that's actually kind of a quirk of ancient and modern Middle Eastern culture, this back and forth sort of haggling. But really, the point here, and the message perhaps for us, is that tenacity, even with God, pays off. Where God is not only justice, God is mercy. Jesus, in a similar way, calls his followers to seek and ask and knock. If you have doors slammed in your face, don't give up. Never stop asking and prodding and pressing for information and understanding. I once heard the definition of success that I, I kind of liked. Success is repeated failure with the refusal to give up. We are going to face challenges and failures and problems in life. It just goes with the territory. But if we have the attitude of tenacity, of not giving up, of picking ourselves up and dusting ourselves off and continuing the search, then I suppose on some level we can call ourselves successful. No matter how much money we make, what kind of car we drive, what kind of status we have in the eyes of others. This may be a welcome message in a university town where many of us are in the business of asking questions and using our disciplinary expertise to try to answer them as best we can. But Jesus has a theological point to make as well. We would not turn a neighbor away even if they knocked at our door at 4 o'clock in the morning and asked us for food because they had neighbors coming or guests coming from out of town, would we? You'd be annoyed. Oh, come on. Really? 4 in the morning? Are you kidding me? But you'd give them food. If a child asks a parent for a snack, oh, it's a Dorito, it's a little lollipop, would we give them a poisonous snake or a scorpion? Probably not. But you who are evil, Jesus says, speaking to the crowd. You know how to do this. How much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask? That's a technique that Rabbi used, that Jesus used to magnify the grace of God, the greatness of God. But uh, he really wants the people to ask for the Holy Spirit, for God to come and reside in them, to be true believers and followers of God in God's way. Quest 
questioning, asking, seeking, knocking are part of the quest that is Christian faith and the adventure of that life in the world. But there is kind of a restlessness that it signals, does it not, to us? that can be unsettling about who we are in our life. St. Augustine said, Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. And so that feeling of restlessness, that stirring, that striving, which can be a sign of the Spirit, can at the same time be challenging for us. And so Christ leaves us with a little gift today. Uh, a marker of his presence and an anchor to hold us along the way. And that is the Lord's Prayer, which we heard in our gospel and which many of us know so well. It teaches us about the heart of God, but it also teaches us about ourselves. <coughs> it comes from a question from the disciples. Lord, how shall we pray or teach us how to pray? Maybe a demand. A question we may ask at times ourselves, how do we address the creator of the universe, the one who spun the planet? How are we even in a position to address God, the creator? Jesus says, when you pray, say, Abba in heaven. Abba. Papa. Daddy. Daddy who's in heaven. That's what Jesus says. How can we call God Daddy? And yet that's what Jesus teaches. Daddy, who is in heaven, the creator of the universe, who dwells within us and loves us like a loving and doting father. A stunning sign of intimacy between Christ and the creator. And he invites us to, to say, to know between us and our God. These words are timeless, and they show us the heart of God. And they show us who Christ is. Hallowed be thy name. God's name is to be revered, never to be taken lightly, certainly never to be taken in vain. That's something that many of us may turn a blind eye to. That God's reign come on heaven, in heaven as on, on earth. God's reign is that to which we point and orient our lives. We seek to realize God's will in our lives of worship and prayer, study and service in our many and varied vocations in the world. We serve God out there in the real world. That God provides us with all we need in life. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The daily bread that we eat. What we may bug our neighbors for at four in the morning comes from God. Our clothing, our housing, everything that we need, and the means of redemption, forgiveness. God forgives us and loves us in spite of our sin, and we are called to be that forgiveness, that loving grace toward others to represent God in the world. That we be spared from the power of evil that is afoot in the world. Lead us not into temptation to save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from the power of the evil one. Biblically, Satan, what Luther called sin, death, and the devil. And if you doubt there is evil in the world, take a look at a newspaper. Just this past week, struggling with yet another shooting in Europe, in Germany. Uh, a horrific killing in France. We see this stuff and it's starting to become routine. This is not normal. This is not good. This is not okay. We have a politics in this country that is self-absorbed, that is full of hatred and vitriol for those people with whom we disagree politically. That is not God's will. Not God's will. That is not realizing the kingdom of God on earth. And so we quest and we continue we search and we question and we prod for who Christ is, where Christ is, and how he's calling us to follow and serve and live and love. The good news is that even in the midst of our questing and our searching and our seeking, that restless spirit that may be the Holy Spirit prodding us forward, we are sought after by the one we seek. And that passionate pursuit of truth that we may have in our hearts 
with that same spirit, God pursues us like a lover pursuing the beloved. And our God, whom we know in Jesus Christ, will not rest, will not stop until he has us in his loving grasp for all eternity.